Hello, my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. I'd like to welcome you back to the third webinar in our Youth Education Series. Welcome back to Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. The topic for today is Upwind Strategy. Sit back, enjoy, and take some notes from some 2021 Tokyo Olympic rock stars. On with the show. A huge welcome to everyone and, and thank you to the IOIA and Sales Inc. For, for making this opportunity happen for, for all of us. It's really fun to talk about sailing in a time when we can't really be on the water. Um, and yeah, we're just really excited to be here with all you guys. So thank you for tuning in. I just want to mention that tonight we're talking about um, upwind tactics. Um, we talked a little bit about upwind strategy a couple weeks ago for those of you who were here to, were able to join us. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about how to put that strategy into some tactical things. First up here, we have a question for all of you. Um, and we, this might be a little bit of a review from a couple weeks ago, but we want to hear from you guys. What is the difference between tactics and strategy? Cool, so that's from Avery and Mason, and, and that's exactly right. Your strategy is the plan that you have for sailing the course. Um, it's, it's your game plan. It's how you would sail the course without anyone else on the course. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about how you make that strategy based on what you know with the wind. Um, and then the tactics is how you execute that game plan with other boats on the course. And I think Avery and Mason, um, yeah, is, that's exactly right, acting out on your game plan. So thank you, Avery and Mason, for tuning in. And um, hopefully that helps clarify what the difference is. And you know, again, strategy is just kind of your overall big picture, your, your game plan. We call it our GP, our game plan. And then the tactics is how you're going to execute that game plan based on all the other boats on the race course. Steph, I really like Charlie McKee's analogy the other day when he talks about elapsed time racing. Like if you have a stopwatch and you were to sail around the race course the fastest alone without any other boats, you'd have to make a bunch of strategy decisions about how you do that. And then you put all the other boats on and then you've got to make tactical decisions about how to get around them. But I like that thought of a stopwatch because we practice alone sometimes, so. <laughs> totally. Cool. And, and Maggie and I kind of, we split our, our, um, our windward beat up into, into three kind of different, different parts where we focus on different priorities. Obviously, speed, strategy, and tactics are always important, and speed is always important, but if we had to assign that to different parts of the course, we would say the first third of the race course, we're focusing on speed. The second third of the race course, we're focusing on strategy, and then the, third, the, the final third, we're thinking about our tactics. Um, you know, like Maggie said, at the end of the day, the goal is to sail the shortest distance to the mark and going as fast as you can. So we'll get into that a little bit further um, in part one, which is speed off the line. Um, remember, your tactics and strategy come a lot easier if you are fast. If you're fast off the starting line, if you have a good start, that first decision is so much easier. And then if you're in that front pack, your, your decisions around the whole race course become a lot easier. So um, last week we talked a lot about how after the start, it's really important to just lock into your boat and go as fast as you can. Um, and then if you can do that, it's, it's a lot easier to execute your strategy. Um, so upwind speed is really important in order to get that first, first jump on the fleet. But how do we know when we're going fast? And I'll, can I make one other comment? Um, have you ever had like a tricky day? This is, this will be a rhetorical question. Sorry. I was going to say everyone put your hand up, but um, <laughs> when you've had a really tricky day and you feel like you can't make any decisions, right. You know, like, Oh, my tactic, I couldn't make any decisions. Right. Well, you have to ask yourself, like, was your start good? And did you have good speed right off the line? And were you able to sail fast? Cause otherwise, you know, Steph was saying the tactics are easy when you're going fast and the tactics are really hard when you're going slow. You don't actually get to make your own decisions. And, um, it's just something to keep in mind. Like, were you in control of your own destiny, you know, and your own decisions offline? Or did you get kind of ping ponged around between boats up the beat? Um, and so I just wanted to point that out. Sometimes we're really critical of ourselves when we have a bad day. And then we think, okay, well, that tactical decision was bad and that was bad. But if you can't have a lane going the way you want, you can't make any good decisions. So totally. Yeah. And so next we just wanted to, ask another question to you guys. What are some factors that you need to think about in order to know if you're going faster? What do you, what are any, any factors you need to think about for a fast boat? What do you do? What do you need to do to go fast? Yeah. 
sale trim. Nice. Adrian Mason killing it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Telltales. Those are important. Very important. Pointing. Nice from Brie. Angles. Angles. Yep. Yeah, totally. Outfits like looking good. What do we think? <laughs> Boat names. Definitely important. Good music. Name from had. Oliver. Sailing flat. Hiking. Yeah, hiking really good. Nice. These are awesome. Clear lane. Love it. Totally. You can do all the right things and have a bad lane. Do you want to reveal the answers? Oh, right. <laughs> or at least what we think about. All right. I forgot it's all animated. Grace, nice one. Communicate. I like it. Awesome. So we, I think we saw a lot of these answers from everyone. Um, but yeah, angle of heel is a really important one. Upwind, having your boat super flat is really important. And like Kai said, hiking when it's really windy so that your boat is really flat is super important. Um, and trimming, making sure that your main sheet and your jib sheet, if you're sailing an X-boat um, or, or 420, are, are properly sheeted. Um, if you're not, if you're a little over trimmed or a little under sheeted, the boat's going to act totally different upwind. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, steering is another important component. Um, making sure that you have, that when you do steer, it's nice and smooth and that you're trying to minimize the amount of steering. Because anytime you're moving your rudder, it's just like a break in the water. Um, Can I make a point? Grace yeah. mentioned communication, and, and that's a really good point. So Steph's last two points about steering and trimming, it goes hand in hand with communicating on a double-handed boat. Like Steph has to be constantly communicating with me, and I've got to be communicating with her because I trim the main sheet, she trims the jib sheet and drives, and so there's a lot of coordination involved uh, between the two of us. And sometimes if we're not communicating and saying the right things and not focusing on the right stuff, then we've got no chance of being fast. So. Totally. Yeah, and then um, from there, making sure your tuning is really good. So your tuning would be like if you're in an expo, your max rake, if you're in an opti, your, your max rake again, um, your gym how your tension, all that stuff goes into your tuning. And that's something we're going to get into a little bit more in a future topic is, is some more tuning. And um, I, 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 we can go crazy with that topic. <laughs> um, and then the controls, making sure that, you're, that you have enough power in the boat. And when we, were, when we talk about controls, we mean your Vang, your Cunningham, um, your outhaul, um, those, are, those are your controls. Um, and then your centerboard, is your centerboard at the right height? Is it all the way down upwind? Um, in our boat, actually, when it, when it starts getting windy, we start lifting our centerboard up. So making sure our centerboard is at the right height for the amount of wind. Um, making sure you have the right angle to the wind. Someone said that, Nisa said that. Um, and then our telltales, making sure those guys are streaming back nice and, nice and good for us. So, these are all the things that we need to be thinking about making the boat go fast in addition to all, all the other things that we have going on in the race course. <laughs> and what do you mean by locked in? Yeah, I think when you it locked in it to me is that feeling when you're just when the boat is just rumbling through the water. You're nice and you're in a, like a powerful stance in the boat. You're hiking, you're you're trimming, you're really well, your boat, your sails are balanced, the boat is balanced and and you just get this, this locked in feeling when everything is, is set up really well. And I also want to point out that um, right off the start, that time we were talking about like on the race course when it, speed matters the most, a lot of times Steph will say like lock it in, lock it in, you know, and full focus on speed. And to me that means, you know, it's not really a time I'm going to bring up like, go, oh, did you see that great cartoon and then whatever, you know, like the only thing that matters is speed. So full focus on keeping the boat flat, Full focus on sheeting right, control, changing controls for transitions, and listening to Steph's feedback on the trim. So, locked into me also means full focus and concentrate. Nice. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we want to touch quickly. Oh, actually, we've got a couple questions, Steph. Not nice. Oh, sorry. Those actually, those were. Um, answers. Answers. Yep, got it. Um, okay, so. Steph is talking about the speed off the starting line, and I want to talk a little bit about ways you can manage that speed by temporarily driving in different modes. And so we break it down into three modes, basically. Um, the first mode is called BMG, and that would be your like normal sailing mode. BMG means it stands for velocity made good, which sounds silly. That's always I've always thought that was kind of funny how they, they say velocity made good. But um, it's basically a combination, it's a formula that takes into account your boat speed and your angle 
and how much progress you're making toward the windward mark. So um, sometimes we measure our VMC, which is our velocity, um, our VMG over a course, like to a point, but your VMG is more about how fast you're going, how high you're pointing, and it's a combination of those two. So your VMG angle, well, what we refer to as VMG angle, is your ideal um, height and speed for that condition. So it's not, um, it's not pinching, it's not footing, it's not, uh, you know, your telltales are basically in VMG mode, your telltales are usually streaming straight back unless you're overpowered. And then maybe you'd have to feather a little bit and do a little pinching to depower and come back down. But for the most part, in your VMG mode, your telltales are streaming straight back if, you're if your sails are trimmed right. And that's like your normal upwind sailing speed mode. Um, okay, so that's VMG. That would be like our normal or our neutral or, you know, what we do most of the time. And then pinching. Pinching sounds kind of bad. And I don't really like to call the height mode pinching, but that's what you're basically doing. You're sailing higher than your VMG, so you're pointing closer to where the wind is coming from. And often when you're pinching, your inside telltale will be luffing and you'll go a little bit slower. So you'll go slower, but you'll go higher. Um, and it's, it's usually like a temporary thing to maybe you're overpowered in a puff and you need to pinch a little bit. Or maybe you have um, a really thin lane and the boat to lure of you is way too close and so you're gonna go into this height mode for a little while. Um, or maybe you're pinching to get around the mark. Those would be times that you kind of use this height mode and, and you pinch for a little bit. And then you, before you slow down too much, then you go back down um, to your BMG. And then footing is the opposite of that, where you head down, you go fast. In our boat, we let the main out, we let the, we ease the jib a little bit, we step back in the boat and we let her rip. Um, okay, so Steph has, has created this beautiful animated diagram of boats doing all three things. So who knows, who would guess uh, if the wind's coming from the top of the board, who do you think is VMG here? You got one, one more clip, Maggie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that high tech stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we found the animation tool. Um, okay, so if you had to guess green, black, or that weird yellow color. Is it yellow on your screen stuff too? Yeah, yeah, we're yellow. Which one do you guys think is VMG? Lucas, black. Black and Lucas. Black, 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 nailed it. Yeah, totally, nice. guys. You got it. Okay, <laughs> cool. So VMG is the one that's is sort of a normal upwind sailing angle. Exactly, everyone got it. And then this would be pinching. You can see how the pinching boat didn't travel as far forward as the other two. And then in contrast to that, the yellow boat that's footing made a lot of distance forward, but lost some height. So, okay, those are the three modes. Now we kind of use these modes as like weapons, if you want. Um, Real when quick, Mike, can we go back? Yep. So, so what would happen, modes... go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, what would happen if, if you thought like you were sailing BMG, but your, your, main, your main sheet was actually just under trimmed, what would happen? Would you actually be sailing BMG? Like if you had your main sheet, let's say your main sheet was eased like two inches from max, like where it should be, you would you'd end up sailing a much lower course, right? Can you hear me? You'd point down. Yep. Yeah, you'd yep. point down. Yeah. Lucas can hear so, you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Exactly. Um, so I think, you know, this, like Maggie said, these are tools that you can use on the race course for sailing different modes, but it also helps you bring a picture, picture to mind of how important it is to have your sails trimmed at the, at the right place. Um, if you're oversheeted, you might end up in this really high and slow mode. If you're undersheeted, you might end up in a really low and fast mode. Sometimes it's good to use these tactically, but sometimes you might just be sailing the wrong angle on the course so it's good to understand where you where your your sail has to be sheeted to sail this really fast vmg close hauled course sweet and um also remember that if your lane is tough like say off the starting line there's someone that's too close to leeward of you and you feel like okay we ha i really really want to go this way and i can't tack yet i can't do a clearing tack then that would be a chance for you to pinch for just a little while create a little bit of space and then go back down to vmg or maybe there's a boat to lure to you and they're gonna pinch you off if you don't roll them first. So you gotta roll them by going bow down until you've rolled them and then right back up to normal. So, okay, cool. Um, All right, so now we're working into the, kind of that second chunk of the race course. We had just, let's say we just crushed the start 
and we're working our way out to one side of the course. And now we start thinking more kind of big picture strategy and course. Um, so we'll start asking ourselves some questions, um, these questions that we have below. Um, where is the most wind on the race course? Are we lifted or headed? Are we in clear air? How much leverage do I have? And which pack am I racing? Um, again, lots of things to be thinking about. We have to ask all those questions about the boat speed, all these questions about the course and strategy. So there's definitely a lot going on out there. Um, we'll go to that next slide here, Maggie. And I know um, two weeks ago, we talked about this as a group. Um, how do we know if we're lifted ahead? And we talked about these three different scenarios of um, being able to recognize how, if a boat is headed or lifted. And it's super easy to see this, you know, on the piece, on the um, PowerPoint here and from a bird's eye view, but how do you tell if you're lifted or headed when you're actually sailing your boat? What are some, what are some tools that you guys use to know if you're headed or lifted? These are my lake sailors. I love it. Using land sites. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. So I, that, I would totally agree. Using a land site is, is a really, really cool way to be able to tell if you're lifted or headed. Um, and obviously it's a little bit harder if you're in an open ocean, but I think a lot of you guys are sailing on lakes. So that's just really helpful tool is when you tack, like kind of take note of what you're pointing toward. And then a minute later, oh, am I pointing still at that same object? Am I pointing above it or am I pointing below it? So that'll really help you understand if you're lifted or headed. Um, another really good thing is um, just asking yourself, am I, am I, is my bow pointing close to the mark? Like if I, if I, if I were to tack right now, would I be cl pointing closer to the mark? Um, that's one thing you can, you can use, you can use your telltales. Like if you're sailing along and all of a sudden one of your telltales starts dancing like crazy, a change has obviously happened. So um, you can look at that. You can also look at other boats. Um, you can take references on other boats, look over your shoulder. Okay. Like these guys look like they're bow even with me and look a minute later, look, oh, actually those guys are lifted inside of me. Okay. So Am I, lift, am I going to get lifted too, or am I going to get headed if I keep sailing? So using all those references are really important um, tools for on the water. It's, it's really easy to see it on the PowerPoint here, but being able to put this into action on the water is a really, really important tool. And I know this, is, this might be a reminder for some guys, because we, I think we went over this the last couple of weeks, but we can't emphasize enough that clear lanes are really important. Um, and it's, it, you have to sail in clear lanes in order to go fast. And this is, we like this diagram a lot from Sail Zing that shows the blanket zone when you are, you are putting your sail between the wind and the next boat. You know, you're blocking a boat from getting as much wind as you have. Um, and that would be your blanket zone. You're literally covering them. You're creating like a blanket between them and the wind. And then there's also this back wind zone, which is actually to windward of someone. Um, and it, it's like this, you get this bad backwash almost off the sail. And it's really slow if you're a boat directly on someone's windward hip. Um, so in this photo here, these three boats, like France, Spain, and Peru, they're all pretty close to each other, side to side. And so they're probably affecting each other and going slow. Whereas like Italy here has a really nice big clean lane. 92, USA has a nice big clean lane. 11 has got a nice big clean lane. And they're going a lot faster than any of these other boats that are trying to like pinch in this light stuff and keep it up on someone's hip. Just a quick does your, does your zone of bad air increase or decrease depending on the wind speed? Good point. It's um, bigger in light air. <laughs> yeah, yep. so this makes in, in light air, it's even more important that you have a, a big fat lane. Um, and as you can see in this photo, it's really light air. So those boats that Maggie pointed out are hurting even more. Feeling the pain. Feeling the pain. <laughs> All right, quiz time, everyone. <laughs> Which boats are in bad air or a tough lane in this photo? Who do you not want to be? <laughs> e from Kai, E from Nisa, Nisa. Totally. E, E, F. Yep, F's in bad air. Cool. F is on their way to clean air, but yeah, you're right. F's been better right now. <laughs> so it looks like the popular answer was E. Oh, now we have some more ones. E, C, and F. Nice. 
EFA. B is going to fall behind. Cool. There's a little bit of it. It's a it's a tricky question because um, it it depends on how you categorize a tough lane. But um, obviously, everyone agrees that E is in a really really bad spot. They are totally covered by both C and both D. Um, C might be in kind of a compromised position because boat D is um, quite bow forward on them and there isn't that much lateral separation between them. So they're not totally in risk right now, but they could be in like what we would call a red zone. Like they're gonna start having to sail that like higher pinching mode that we were talking about. Um, and then boat B, what do you think about boat B, Maggie? Boat B would be okay for a little while, but I'd be afraid that A was going to rule us. Yeah, totally. Boat A is in a really powerful position here because they're boat e they're bow even with boat B, and then they have a lot of separation to leeward until boat C. So a lot of room to drive around a big lane so that they can feel really comfortable um, with their moting and their speed. And then obviously boat F just in a tough position sailing behind everyone, but like Maggie said, on their way to a clean lane. And boat B can't really put their bow down and go very fast to defend because they'll quickly fall into C. See how there's like not that much, there's, this, there's probably half the distance between these two boats as there is between A and B. Um, so if A puts their bow down and starts going really fast, B doesn't have so many options, right? Totally. And you guys can also check out how hard people are hiking. Like these girls in boat E are like crouching because they're in such bad air. Uh, whereas A is like, woohoo, straight leg traffic. <laughs> We're going fast. So yeah. Does anyone have any questions about this? Or anything we've talked about so far? Did you guys see yourselves using, you know, being one of these boats on the race course and understanding if you're in a good lane or bad lane? Maybe give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Lucas cool. is good. <laughs> Anyone else? Why wrong. is F on a reach? I think that's just Lucas. Um, Lucas asked, why is F on a reach? And I think that's just the yeah. angle our boats sail. We sail really wide angles um, in the 49er. Yeah. It's, and the angle that the picture's taken from sort of makes it look like they're reaching. But yeah. Yeah. They're probably, it's probably 95 degree tacking angle and stuff yeah is the d crew in the water <laughs> it feels uh, like that sometimes i'll tell you <laughs> mm. no i think she's getting splashed that's pretty normal <laughs> all right cool oh question how do you get out of e's position and what is something b could do to get in a more secure position. Cool, so if you were E, um, we would be looking to get out of there as soon as possible. And obviously it would be maybe a little bit hard to tack right away. So we might have to, well, we do what we call a dip and tack. So we would put the bow down just a little bit, create some space to windward of us, and then tack so that we're in a good position to duck boat C and duck boat B and duck boat A. So that's what we would call the dip and tack there to get out of boat E's position. Um, and then boat B, I think it kind of depends on if you want to keep going straight. Um, if you're really trying to hold on to that lane, it's, it's a super tough position because like Maggie said, A could potentially roll over the top of you. They have, they're in a really powerful position, but you're trying to keep your lane on boat C as well. So um, if, I think if we were boat B, we would say, okay, we really, you know, we're in a really thin lane here. We have to really manage our height and our speed and our height and our speed and I would keep tabs on the boat to windward of us boat a to kind of see what mode they're going into um, and we can only match it for so long so if boat a was putting the bow down we'd try to match for as long as we could and then probably accept that we'd have to tack out of there soon I also think that C E and D are gonna be going slow with each other soon because mm -hmm. D is kind of pinching C is going to have to start pinching soon. And so we might also put the bow down if we were B, put the bow down, go fast, and then tack out before we get slow with them. Because mm -hmm. that's something that tends to happen when, when people are in, in packs and in clumps. They sail slower and they look around at each other a lot and they don't realize that everyone is together going slow. And so 
yeah, it's just something to think about. If you see a pack that's going slow, you say, go fast to it and then get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get out before we go slow. Cool. Good questions here. We have another one. Um, how can C escape D? Um, I think C's mode here is to sail and sail high mode. Again, this is assuming that everyone wants to keep going straight here. Um, so if C wants to keep going straight, they have to sail in a high mode. So trim your sails in just a little bit, um, try to put the bow up just a little bit, um, and then look for it, like try to gauge, try to gain space to windward. And then um, when you have it, you can put the bow to back down for a little bit more speed. Um, and then Al just asked if, if E could just foot off and go to leeward of D. And that in our boat, that is um, sometimes a possibility. Um, it happens around the leeward mark sometimes. It kind of depends on the breeze. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to do it in light air um, because you can't plane out underneath. Um, it, it's a move you can do, and people do it, like, off the pin end of the starting line sometimes. You have to be able to, like, really – you have to really commit to putting the bow down um, and really, like, planing um, from that position. Because if you can't plane, you'll never, you'll never break through. And it's a pretty drastic mode, so you'd have to – want to go that way for a long time yeah you know sure. basically have no other options like i think tacking twice actually sometimes might be better than sailing under everyone and then getting pinned under there yeah nice awesome stuff guys thank you good questions good answers all right so another question that we have to ask ourselves when we're in this phase phase two of the windward beat is who am I racing and do I have leverage on who I'm racing? So in this example, you can see um, this red line represents the ladder rung. Um, and that's a, a line perpendicular to the wind that helps you understand who you're racing. So in this situation, you can see the American um, boat, um, us, and then the Spanish and the Dutch boat number 64. We're in one pack that's on a pretty similar ladder rung. 64 is starting to fall off a little bit, but for now we'll kind of pretend they're on the same ladder rung. But then you can see on the opposite tack, on port tack, um, you have Norway, um, Australia, and France on port tack on the same ladder rung as us. So we're right now, we're same ladder rung, but now we're, but we're gaining leverage away from each other. Um, and that base, leverage basically means there's lateral separation between two packs. The pack heading to the left has leverage on the pack heading to the right. It's, they're, they're sailing away from the middle of the course. Um, and leverage is basically, if you have leverage, it's, it means you have an opportunity to gain on a shift. So um, if you have a lot of leverage, you have a lot of opportunity to gain on a shift, but you also have a lot of um, risk because there, if the shift doesn't go your way, you could lose a lot. Um, but an important thing is if you have leverage and you think you've gained on a shift to cash it in by tacking and crossing everyone. So the rule of thumb is to cross when you can. Do you guys and have any step, questions on that? Yeah, I just want to clarify. So leverage, is it fair to say that if you're farther from the center line than another boat, you have more leverage? Yeah, or if you're farther away from a pack of boats. It's, it's like your lateral separation between yourself and a pack of Boats. Yeah, and, and the lateral term that Seth is using refers to the horizontal ladder rungs. If we were to imagine a diagram with the wind coming from the top of the course, or, you know, the top of the page, um, and the and lateral is in reference to like side to side away from the middle of the course, side to side. Cool. So in this scenario, if we were to say, who are we racing? Um, we would say, okay, we're racing Spain, and then we're racing. Um, that pack of boats that's on port on the same ladder rung as us. And I just want to touch on something. When Steph and I were talking about this presentation, it was so funny because Steph said, oh, I remember winning races when I was younger and I would be so nervous because I didn't know what to do. And I said, oh, I never won any races when I was younger. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah, let's talk about it. I feel so bad for you, Steph. You used to feel nervous. No, I'm kidding. It, that's a real thing. Then I, then I also said, wait, sometimes I still feel like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, wait, we haven't outgrown that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it is really nerve wracking, right? Like, especially on the second beat, when there's a little more separation between the boats, um, and you feel like, okay, I'm in a good spot, and I just want to finish here. We want to give you a couple techniques to just basically keep your position 
uh, relative to other boats or other packs of boats. Because we do, like, if we decide, hey, we're in a good spot and we want to finish here, then we switch to, like, defensive tactics, you know, and we just kind of try, instead of trying to make big gains and take big risks, we try to just finish where we are. And so we, we talk about covering other boats or packs. Um, there are two kinds of covers. There's a tight cover, which is when you literally put your boat between the wind and another boat and, and they're directly in your bad air, you're affecting them negatively, they're going slow and they gotta get out, like almost immediately, right? So that's like you tack and you're really close to someone and they're immediately gonna go slower. Okay, so that's a tight cover. And you can see in this diagram, the bad air is like washing all over this boat that's getting covered. Okay, and a loose cover would be when you keep yourself between the boat or the pack and the mark, but you're not necessarily affecting them with your bad air. Um, and so with the loose cover, you can kind of think of it as more of like a geographical cover or a zone cover. And that's basically just keeping track of like where they are, where the line is, where the mark is, and then put yourself between them and the mark. And it's pretty simple, right? You just keep going. And then when they tack, you tack. <laughs> yeah. um, the sooner you get to lay line in that situation, the easier it is, right? Like, you want to get to a ley line because then they have no options to get around you if they're with you on that side of the course. Um, and then I want to point out, so in this, in this diagram over here, um, in our tracking, and we use SAP tracking analytics, well, our class does, 49er FX does, 49er sailing does, and it's awesome. Um, this yellow line means that this boat is leading. It's like a leader line to just show, and that's a ladder rung. Um, so let's imagine the wind is coming from the top of the course. The leader line is here. It's, um, it's just a little bit skewed, but you don't need to worry about that. We think this pink boat here ha is in a really strong covering position because everyone to lure of her is in her zone, right? So they're basically bow even if they're close or slightly bow out the farther away they are. Because think about it, if these boats tacked, pink is crossing them no problems, right? And the farther away, these guys can be a little further up down here because there's so much more distance uh, laterally, you know, side to side. Okay, and then behind her, everyone's basically falling in either directly behind her or just to windward on her hip. And again, the farther away we go, the higher up they can be because we know if she tacks, she's crossing, no problems. So pink is in like a real sweet spot. Pink should be feeling good and just thinking about, okay, well, you've got, we're getting to the lay line. We've got one more tack. Happy days, focus on speed. Okay, whereas down here, red has got a weak cover, really only one boat is in their zone. So this purple, this purple boat here is in red zone because she's to lured and slightly bow back. Um, but I think if red would attack here, purple could uh, hail starboard. And so red would have to take like a big avoiding action um, and that would be slow. And then also these boats, these three uh, have what Steph was calling leverage. That's what we're talking about. Their leverage on her, on, on the red boat. There's, there's more separation between these guys and the middle of the race course. There's lateral separation between this boat and those, and therefore their leverage and they are a threat. You know, so they could tack. If, if the wind shifts a little bit left, boom, now they've got a really nice little lead. They can tack and cross, no problem. If they get a little more pressure, they can go bow down, go faster, tack and cross. So Red is not really safely covering anyone except this one purple one, and pink up here is looking good. Everyone's in her zone. Okay, so those are some covering basics. Do we have any questions come up about that? Nope. No. Any questions about the leverage, who you're racing, how to cover, any, anything in that category? That's a lot of, lot of info right there. Cool. Sweet. Nice job, guys. All right, so now let's imagine that we've crushed that second um, part of the course and now we're getting to the top of the course where we really have to start thinking about our tactics um, and a really big thing that happens on the race course is when you start coming back together with other boats you have to to think do I cross do I tack or do I duck um, and these are some more questions that you guys can ask yourselves on the race course <laughs> hopefully you're taking notes <laughs> um, so when you come into any crossing situ any situation where you might have to tack cross or duck ask yourself these things uh oh step my lane. okay how is my lane? After, ask myself these things oh no i'm sorry guys um okay so ask yourselves these things lifted am i in the max pressure on the race course where's the mark how is my lane 
and where is the fleet? So those are things that you can think about um, anytime you come into a crossing. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so a um, couple questions for you guys. We're, um, in this scenario, if you were the black boat, would you cross, tack, or duck? Jacob says cross, 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 cross. Nice, nailed oh. it. <laughs> All right, we started with an easy one. <laughs> All right, so if you're the black boat in this situation, cross, tack, or duck? Tack, we have one tack, tack. Okay. <laughs> oh, we have one duck, a tack, a lee bow. Okay. No one says jive? <laughs> I'll let you try that one, Maggie. <laughs> okay. All right, so anyone who's answered, I want you to look where the windward mark is and let me know if you change your answer. Lucas says duck. All right, so that's, so going back to the questions that we talked about, here you're thinking about where where is the mark and the priority is just to keep keep sailing towards the mark. So probably not able to cross in this situation, given how the boats are coming together. It might either bow to bow. So you would have to duck. Um, and that would be your best move in order to keep going towards the mark. If you tack, you're going to, you're, you're basically already on ley line where you are. So if you tack, you're going to be sailing over ley line and then tacking back above ley line and sailing extra distance to the mark. So just because someone's yelling starboard at you doesn't mean you have to tack, you can duck them as well. Cool. What about if you're black in this situation? Tack from one person. Tack from Lucas, tack, duck. So question stuff, is green on ley line? Okay, this might be a little tricky one because in my eye, green is overstood. <laughs> okay. okay, so we think green is over overstood on the ley line. Yeah. I could have made that a little bit more obvious, I think. <laughs> so, so, so if green is overstood on the ley line, for those of you who answered duck, would you still want to duck? I would say if they're overstood and you, there's enough space for you to tack onto your ley line, you definitely want to, you definitely want to tack below them. Um, because again, you don't want to, if you duck them, you would sail a ton of extra distance. Let's say, uh, let's say they're three boat lengths overstood there, two boat lengths overstood. Um, and you have being able to put that tack in there and leave out and lead them back to the mark would be a really powerful position. So, um, just a couple of scenarios to get you guys thinking about, okay, here we have, oh, thank you, Maggie. <laughs> here we have a couple of examples about ley lines. We are, another example, we are in the middle of the course, but we are looking at pressure. So coming into every one of these scenarios, you have to ask yourself those questions, and then you basically have to make an analysis of which, which one of those questions takes most priority. Because yeah, maybe here there's more pressure above green, but you would sail extra distance to get to them. So um, you'd want to just tack on the ley line. So thinking about all those different things coming into any crossing situation is really important. Um, and, oh, that's beautiful, Maggie. <laughs> I know, that's nice, right? Can you tell which one I want to do? <laughs> I'm kidding. And one important thing is that the earlier you can predict this, the better. So this is where all the being able to tell how you're coming across. Okay, I have a clear cross. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm crossing. I might have a duck. I definitely don't have, you know, a lee bow because if I were to tack, they would roll over me. So knowing if you're strong or weak coming into these positions, and the sooner you can tell that, the earlier you can make your game plan. Uh oh, how do I go to the annotations? 
Does anyone have any questions on that? Cool, you guys are awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so I wanna share with you this idea about when you're trying to tack out of a corner. So um, if you take steps like tack, duck, or cross scenario, and instead of thinking only about the starboard lay line at the mark, let's back it up a little bit because when you get out to the left side or you get all the way out to the right side, when you tack out of that pack matters a lot. Um, and having a nice clean lane all the way back across the course is really important. Um, so in this scenario, let's imagine that we've started on starboard. It was a total drag race and we made it all the way to the left-hand side of the course without tacking. We did that along with a handful of boats. In our fleet, that happens a lot when it's like windy days and you don't want to tack very often. So let's just imagine we're on the left side of the course and now we're thinking about, okay, how do we tack and get into the windward mark? We're, you know, we're not necessarily looking to make our last tack um, on the ley line. Um, but we want to, we want a good exit plan to know that we're going to have a really clean, good lane all the way back across the race course. So these colors represent what we think is, um, the best and then okay. And then bad, uh, and green is the best yellow is okay. And red is bad, bad, bad. So red, let's start with the, the obvious, the mistake. This is a big mistake if we sail like all the way over the ley line, especially if we're pretty far away from the mark. The farther you are away from the mark and the more you overstand, the more extra distance you've just sailed. So we don't ever want to overstand. Overstanding and sailing extra distance, it's like you may as well just sail the same medicines, but like drop your main chain and stop your boat for a little while and let everyone else sail around you, right? Like it's bad. We don't want to sail extra distance, okay? It'd be like, instead of driving a straight line, then we're like driving in a, like a squirrely line like this. Like we would never do that, right? So let's not sail way over ley lines. Okay, so we all, got, we all agree, we're not gonna sail over ley lines. So coming into this, as this pack, if you are not like winning the pack, um, you have to kind of ask yourself like, am I gonna be able to tack in the spot that I wanna tack? Or if I tack in that spot, is someone gonna tack on me? Um, and so Steph and I will ask each other like, can we get tacked on? You know, and if the answer is yes, then we know that our option one or the best one might not be available to us. And so that's why we start thinking about the next best options. Um, okay, so before we talk about the next best, let's talk about the best. We think this is the best lane. If this is a ley line here, uh, you, you want to go just below ley line by like four or five boat lengths, four or five, six boat lengths, anywhere in there. If you do that, imagine we tack on a port in this lane. And then we cruise all the way over here. And then by the time we get to starboard ley line, we put a beautiful tack right on ley line because we're pretty close to the mark. So we know exactly where the ley line is. We tack, we're on starboard by the time we get into the three boat length zone and we're at full speed before we round the mark. So we avoid a tack set, which is pretty slow if you have a spin anchor in your boat. Or we, and we avoid having to come into the windward mark zone on port. So that's why we think this is the best lane that allows you to get out of the left, have a nice, sweet, clean lane coming out of there, and then you tack onto starboard, but you're outside of the zone still, you get to go fast, you get to kind of choose where you're tacking there, and all's good, so that's best. Now let's talk about the next bests. So if we're not winning this pack as we get to the left side, you know, say if we think about that diagram of the boats that had bad air and good air, some of those boats, if, so, if, uh, if, the, if they tack, they could easily get tacked on, Right? There's enough distance between them where a boat to windward could just say, oh yeah, I want that lane and tack on them. And then they'd be in really better. Okay, so if you think you can get tacked on, then we've got two options for you. Your first next best option is down here. It's actually to go before um, this best lane. It's to get out early. And the reason for that is if you get out early from this left side, so say you tack and you're 10 bull lengths under that ley line or something, so that maybe there'd be another 30 seconds to sail on, until you get to port ley line. If you tack there and you get in this lane, next best one, and if you get tacked on again, so say someone else gains on you or you know someone that is ahead of you tacks, then you can still tack back out and uh, clear your lane without having to overstand and to get in this graveyard of overstanding this, okay? So the reason this is next best number one is because you have that 
that second option. You've got a plan B and the plan B is pretty good. Plan B is let's tack and then get a clean lane. Um, your plan B here is not so great. If you get tacked on and you're on the port lay line, then you've got to tack and overstand. Okay, so these are just some ways to think about um, exiting the corner and which lanes we want. We want to be tacking like four to six boat lengths under this port lay line. And if you're gonna get tacked on, you wanna go a little bit early and get out while you can. And um, we don't wanna get up here ever. Okay, so I have a video for you. Let's back it up. All right, so this is a start where the left side of the course is favored. I've highlighted five boats and we are actually the purple, well, like the dark purple indigo boat in the middle, USA 50. And we're not doing so hot. We're in like, well, we're 12th to 9th or so and so on or in that area. So we're not busting into the top 10 that easily. Our lane is not really great. Um, sorry, it's a little jumpy here. I just wanted to show you that the windward mark is like right here. The windward mark will be right up here. Um, okay, so we're starting to get to the left side of the course and I want to pause. Oops, sorry guys, that didn't work how I wanted it to. Sorry, bear with me. Oop, gotta watch it again. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, we sailed straight off the starting line and we really wanted to get to the left. And we're not winning this pack. There are other boats clearly ahead of us, right? We know that if we tacked, and remember we're USA 50, we're like the indigo boat in the middle. If we tacked, GBR7 could tack on us. Spain 23 could tack on us. Uh, there are a few other boats. So we know, hey, we can get tacked on. So watch what happens here. When we start getting over to this left side, we're kind of sort of close to ley line. The word remarks like right up here. We're thinking we have to go before other boats go because we're not gonna get that sweet spot green lane that we want. So we tack and you'll see in a second where the winter mark is, but it's right about up here. So we're about 20% under this ley line. We've got nice clean air, right? Now we're happy. We're like, sweet, we got it. Denmark had a similar idea, which was, okay, I have to duck these boats. They can tack on me. I gotta go early. I gotta get out of here before I overstand, right? Now we have nice clean lanes. Denmark has nice clean lanes. There are a couple of boats to lure of us who maybe Den or to lure of Denmark, or maybe Denmark's hurting. Um, someone on our hip, they probably they're in our zone. We're probably not affecting them too badly, but they're at least they're in our zone. Okay, so we took the next best one, and I wanted you guys to see what Spain did here. Spain, let's back that up a touch. So Spain was in a good position and probably tried to take the best lane. Um, but GBR tacked on her. And so she's not hurting her right now. So I'm talking about these red and orange lines. So red's gonna start hurting. And because she took uh, best or next best lane, she is able to tack out here. She tacks, clears her air, tacks right back. And she's not overstood, which is great. She's probably right on ley line. That is, that's super sweet. And she had this plan B because she didn't get greedy and go all the way to the port ley line. Um, I don't highlight all of these boats, but I'll tell you that right now they're like 11, 10th or 11th place, 10th or 11th or so. These ones are over ley line. When they get to the winter mark, they just lose, 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 lose. Everyone, there are 25 boats racing. Everyone that they were ahead of gains on them. When they're overstood and sailing under boats that are rounding, um, and sailing extra distance. So um, I just want you to keep an eye on how this is all playing out. Uh, Spain did its clearing tack. Now they're in like third, which is great. France was behind these other boats. And so they took that next best option, which is great. Denmark and USA, we're both in the top, uh, Denmark's in top five, we're in top 10 and we're happy. We were like not winning that pack on the left side, but we sailed all the way across the course in clean air. We were pretty close to the ley line or to the mark when we chose ley line. So we were able to get, have a good ley line. Um, and I'm sorry, guys, I'm trying to pause this. Won't pause for me. Okay. Um, and I want to show you one more thing here that we tack on ley line. And because we're pretty close to the, the mark, we know where that ley line is, right? The farther you are away from it is, the farther you are away from the ley line, the harder it is to guess properly. And so you can see all these boats are overstanding. So, um, Okay, whatever. I made my point on that side. <laughs> the video wants to be done. The video's like, we're over here. So it's kind of the same process coming out of the right corner. 
um, the, if, if you're about halfway up the course or two thirds of the way up the course, so you're still pretty far from that lay line, your best option is to tack at like 80%. So um, we talked course percentages last week, but 80% would be like, you have sailed 80% on port and then you've got about 20% left until you get to that starboard lay line. Um, and the reason we think that is because when you're down here, it's very hard to call a ley line and you will likely get tacked on, right? So by going here or here, we can hitch back out to ley line when we're a little bit closer to the mark. So you can make a good judgment and um, when you can, uh, and, and not have to overstand. And we don't need to talk more about this, but this is so bad, bad, bad mistake, extra distance. Okay. A big takeaway here is that if you're, it's really hard to gauge your ley line really early in the, in the leg. So waiting to make that ley line decision until a little bit later on if you can, um, and then picking your lane to come into the mark is really important. So having a good fast lane, um, if you can, coming into the mark. Yeah. And so like Seth was saying, the farther you are away from it, the harder, A, it's two parts. Uh, the first is that it's harder to know when you're on ley line. The farther you are from something, the harder it is to get gauge it. But B, things might change, right? you might get a shift and then you're way overstood or get a shift and then you're understood and you get attacked on. So I wanted to show you guys this like ley line fan. This is green dotted line is a real ley line. And then these red ones show you how number one, people are either overstanding because they didn't know where ley line was or two, um, these boats and these ones, they're just going a little further than the next boat and a little further than the next boat to have clean air. And if everyone does that, they get a little further and further and further and further away from the mark. And so look how overstood this boat is compared to these ones that make it, right? That's like a lot of extra boat length. So that's what we call the ley line fan. So if you get onto ley line too soon, you're gonna have to tack back out, overstand, tack back in. But if you take that like sweet spot lane up, then you get to tack in one of these spots and choose your, choose your um, lane more uh, precisely. Okay, so I've got one more video about this ley line game. We'll see if it, okay. I'll try not to restart it too many times, but I just wanted to point out, so these boats have come out of the right side of the race course and they've tacked at like, I'd say 85% of the court, you know, so they're probably like 10 to 15 boat lengths under this starboard ley line. And this one's at like 90%, so probably 10% under. Um, they've tacked under there and you can already see this ley line fan starting to happen. I happen to know that this, uh, I think, I think ley line's right here. I think number one is on ley line and they're gonna make it. And so, here, I'll put this in here. Let's see. If, if we know that's ley line, look how far overstood some of these boats are. That's like so many extra boat lengths. Like this, <laughs> it'd be easier if you just stopped sailing and dropped your main sheet and then kept going again, right? Instead of sailing 25 extra boat lengths out here. Okay, so, so this summer when you guys are on the water racing, make sure you think about Coach Maggie when you start getting near that ley line. <laughs> yeah, I only know it because I've gotten in trouble for doing it too many times. But, okay, what I want to point out is that um, Italy went back at a time that she was controlled by the boats around her. So she had a couple boats on her hip and she couldn't tack. Then she had a couple starboard boats that she had to duck. And she ends up losing this whole pack here. Whereas Britain, GBR, the green boat, went out to ley line, was a little more patient, and they went out to ley line at a time that they could cross the starboard boats that they were near, and then they didn't have anyone on their hip controlling them. And you can see how many boats uh, GBR gained on Italy there. So I wanted to point out two things in that video. One is the clear lane that is uh, a few steps under the ley line. You know, it's like 10 or 20 bowlings under that ley line that you can get, get closer to the mark, and then be able to, um, you then can be able to call a better ley line. But two, when you do decide to go out to that ley line, make sure you're in a, a good position on the boats around you. You don't wanna like tack under a boat and then not be able to tack back when it's time to go on ley line, right? You don't wanna like tack and immediately have to duck a bunch of starboard boats and lose all that distance. So just be patient and look one step ahead and look at like how the ley line's forming and you wanna avoid the ley line fan and you wanna control your own destiny. So you wanna tack when you're strong and when you're in control of it. Awesome. Right. So that was a lot of information we just threw at you guys. Yeah, it was. Uh, actually, sorry, Maggie, next slide. <laughs> oh. That one must not have gotten deleted. Um, 
What are some things that calm ner help calm nerves before a big regatta? It's a really good question um, from Adam McLean. And um, I think everyone, everyone has different ways of, ways of dealing with nerves. Um, and I think like a really good one is, is having your process and having like a checklist that you can go through. So we talked last week about our pre-start checklist. We've given a bunch of questions that you can think about during um, racing so you could actually visualize maybe ahead of time. Um, and I think just having, yeah, do checklists for on shore, for when you get to your boat, for when you get on the water, and then that gives your mind something to think about and it, it, it just distracts you from any nerves that you might be feeling. Um, and I think just also like taking some deep breaths, having a good songs stuck in your head, those are all really helpful things for helping for nerves. Like when I'm nervous, I love having a song stuck in my head because it keeps my mind um, away from any nerves. Steph, I just pulled up our boat prep checklist because you mentioned checklists and I just want to show you guys like this kind of an activity is really helpful for me, for example, when um, I'm nervous, like I like to go through and go through all of these uh, boat prep checklist options. Sorry, now I've got a spinning thing. <laughs> um, and that just makes me feel like I'm more prepared and that everything that I can control is in my control, you know, everything that's in my control, I am controlling, which is equipment readiness, preventative maintenance, and, um, you know, checking on your gear, making sure everything's in order, everything's clean, everything's been polished, everything's been measured. Um, and all those things make me feel like, okay, you know, what happens tomorrow on the race course isn't totally in my control, but I can at least know that I'm ready and that I have a system and I use my lists and uh, that, yeah, that really helps me. And puzzles pass the time. <laughs> I really like puzzles. Like puzzles. <laughs> but if we're nervous on the water, we really go through our pre-start um, homework. We go through our reminders and sometimes we'll sing a song. So. Yeah. Well, we have a question from Jude. Is it a good idea to teach a crew from scratch? Yeah. I think anytime you can get more people involved in the sport, that's a really good opportunity. And, um, you know, having, I think there's certain qualities that you can look for in a partner and it's up to you of like what you think is most important um, and what your goals are. So um, for me, example, like Maggie is a really hard worker. She's really um, technically very good. She's good at trimming the sails. She understands sail control and shape. And um, so she's a really good partner for me. Um, and, you know, our goal is to win an Olympic medal and I think she's the perfect fit for that. So I think in, it's, Whatever your goals are, you, that will help you answer that question. Hopefully that helped. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with learning together. You know, you're, you're learning together and you might think you've got a leg up because you have more experience and time in the boat, but eventually your learning curves will meet. And um, yeah, don't, don't worry about having a lot to learn. It's actually a good, thing, good place to be. Yeah, totally. Um, on that note, we have a question. Do you have, do you have any conflicts with your crew and how do you deal with them? <laughs> no, never. None. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm joking. part of the process and part of learning and part of sport is, yeah, you will, there will be some conflicts. It's not always going to be rainbows and butterflies, but, um, it's how you get through them. Um, and we have really an understanding on our team that we, um, that we all, we both have the same goal at the end of the day. So we're just, you know, anytime that a conflict might happen, which it doesn't very often, <laughs> luckily on our team, but if it does, it's just, Hey, you know, we're on the same, we're, we're working towards the same goal here. Um, how can I understand your point of view a little bit better or something like that? Yeah. And I'll, I'll also say that we found, um, being really careful with how we communicate helps conflict resolution. Like the way you say things can make a situation erupt in flames, right? Or it can make a situation be, you know, pretty peaceful and, and we can work through it. So we learned pretty early on that it's not what you say most of the time, it's how you say it, right? So um, when you think about, and, and it's when you say it too, right? Like on the race course, I wouldn't say, Steph, that was so stupid. You know what I mean? I'm, well, first of all, I've never called Steph stupid, but in the heat of the moment, that's never the time to like point out an error. You know, if, if we make a mistake, they know it was a mistake. It doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be addressed at that moment. 
And so you have to be really uh, thoughtful about when you bring things up. When we've also learned you do not bring things up when you're hungry, when you're cold, and when you've been in a wetsuit for eight hours. That will <laughs> never be a good time to have a constructive conversation that will lead to conflict resolution. No, no, no. So we ask, are you hungry? You know, you have to make sure everyone feels comfortable in the conversation. Also, sleep on it, write it down, talk to talk it out with your coach, and then the next day say, hey, can we talk about this? You know, hey, how are you? And, and that kind of thing. Cool. All right, lots of questions. This is awesome, yeah. guys. Um, we have one, what time do you take off, what time do you start to take off at the starting line? Um, and I'm guessing that's um, for accelerations. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's different for every boat and it's different based on the speed that you currently have. So let's say your boat is totally stopped at the starting line. That's that amount of time that it takes for your boat to build speed is going to be different than if you're going like half, you know, one knot or two knots um, upwind. So that, that's the first part of it. And then the second part is, um, yeah, what, what type of boat you're in and, and how windy it is. In light air, it's gonna take a lot longer for your boat to build speed, where in heavy air, it might not take as long. So one thing that is super helpful for understanding your acceleration time is going next to a mark. Let's say you're doing your warm up for a race. You can go next to one of the buoys that's been set and put your bow next to it and then just time how long it takes you to accelerate. So you can, you can slow down or fully stop and then accelerate and then just time, you know, count to yourself, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, as you go through your acceleration and you can do it a couple times and get a feel for how long it takes your boat to get to full speed. And that was really helpful for us when we were late to a lot of starting or starts where we'd watch the tracker later and say, oh my gosh, we were not going, we weren't at full speed until 10 seconds after everyone else. We figured out, okay, we know that if the boat is absolutely stopped, in order to be going, it takes a minimum of seven seconds, right, Seth? It was seven. Yeah. So we know that, like, in all conditions, if, if I say, okay, we're going at five seconds because I think we're really close to the line, we are going to be very late. Like, we have to, no matter what, pull the trigger at seven because that's how our boat works. So, yeah, you can always find that out and then use that as a tool. But it changes for all the conditions and it changes based on how far you are from starting. Sorry, so Steph said that. All right. Cool. A couple more questions here. Um, what do you do when teaching a kid and they get scared and nervous? Um, I think that goes back to what we were talking about is um, take for me, taking a deep breath really always helps um, when I'm nervous and just take a minute to pause, um, you know, make sure that they feel safe in the situation. I think that's really, really important, making sure everyone feels safe. Um, and if the situation is safe, you know, helping them understand it, you know, this isn't, this isn't scary because we're safe. You know, it's, it's okay to, to get yourself out of your comfort level a little bit, take a deep breath. Um, I think a breath is a super powerful thing to do. Also, it's, it helps sometimes to just say that, are you feeling scared? Are you feeling nervous? Steph and I get scared on this boat. You know, sometimes we go, we sail 49 FXs, Lucas, and sometimes we go 20 miles an hour downwind and it can be totally scary. And so it helps if I'm feeling scared to just say to Steph, I'm feeling kind of scared today. I'm tired. I'm, I'm worried that we're going to wipe out and someone's going to get injured, you know, whatever that might be. Maybe it's the end of a long training session or something. Um, saying it out loud helps. And then I know that my teammate is going to be there for me. Yeah. Um, your coach just relating to the kid too and saying, I would be nervous too if I were sailing. I think that can go a long way too. Yeah. Tell them to sing a song. That helps us. Yeah, sing a song. <laughs> it's okay to be nervous. That means they care. Yeah. yeah. So if, you're, if it's a racing situation, I like to remind kids that, hey, being a little nervous is good. It means you care. So. Yeah. Cool. We have one from Avery and Mason. Um, what should you do when going upwind and there is a big best way to get out of the middle of a pinwheel? Some good questions. Um, so if you're coming up wind and there's a big clump at the mark, um, you know, sometimes that's stuff that you just can't avoid. Um, if you see it early enough and you're in a position to go on the outside, um, if there's like a big wrapped up at the mark, we would just say we're, we're not getting involved and we would maybe that's an opportunity for you to maybe overstand on the ley line a little bit so that you can actually go around the outside of everyone. Um, and I would say the same in a pinwheel. If, People, if tons of people are wrapped up, look for an opportunity to go around the outside. Or if you're at the gate, maybe try to split to the other mark. 
Um, or slow down and go behind them. Because yeah. the, what you don't want to do is get locked on the outside of a pinwheel. So being able to ease your sails, maybe drive extra distance. That, that's the one time we will permit the squiggly line driving. Drive some extra distance to slow your boat down. If you see people are just getting rafted up and they're getting farther and farther away, wait your turn and then round close to the mark because that's going to end up being a better lane. Cool. Um, all right, we have one more. What? Like, that's the way to avoid the compass to not get in it. <laughs> uh, one more from Sophie and Tilly. What is the coolest animal we've seen while sailing? A whale, for sure. Yeah. We saw a whale in Long Beach. The whale was pretty cool. <laughs> we're, we were in Long Beach, California, and um, a whale had come into, not into the heart, there's like a big bay there, and the whale had come into the bay, and we were sailing along, and um, basically like went right beside it and I was so terrified that the whale was going to surface and capsize our boat. I was like so scared to get next to it. It looked like a school bus underwater. Yeah, it was so big. It was definitely the size of a school bus. Cool. These are awesome questions you guys and we really appreciate you guys getting so involved in this chat. It's really fun for us to to talk to all of you. We miss sailing a lot um and if you ever have any from kai is uh oh. is sailing the 49er fun hard or both yes <laughs> all of the above everything <laughs> it's very hard it's physically hard so we have to work out a lot so that we're strong enough and we won't get injured doing it and it seems like the stronger you get the more you can push the boat then the more you can push the boat the stronger you have to be and so it's like this this big big um challenge it's a constant challenge and that's so fun and it's uh and we both love how fast it goes. Sometimes it scares us a little bit, but that's also good. And we love how fast things happen. It's like bam, 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 bam. You know, they're, they're, everything's happening fast and you're always kind of on the edge. And the other really fun thing about it is when it's windy, it's so hard to even like tack and jibe, you know? So we feel kind of silly. We're training for the Olympics. And if it's really windy, we'll be like, let's go out and try to do 10 jibes today, you know, and that'll be a good day. <laughs> so um, it, the, the boat can be humbling too but it's so fun. Every second of it, we, we miss it and we love it. And if, yeah, I would highly recommend you guys sail skiffs and yeah. do some spreading. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks guys so much for tuning in. If you ever have any questions, you can reach out to us on our social media or email us, robleshaysailing at gmail.com. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, and thank Well, thanks guys. I think Beth has some parting words before you guys all sign out. I just wanted to say thank you, Maggie and Steph. We're just so lucky to have you share your strategies and, our and your tactics with us. I'd like to again thank the sponsors, the organizers, presenters, and most importantly, today's viewers. We appreciate, appreciate your participation so much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Have a good evening.